All right. We'll get started on our lesson here, lesson number two. The title of it, He That Believeth on Him. Now remember, last, last week we, we studied on the lesson of re- repent, repent or perish, and uh, we expounded on that. Today, we're uh, going to be uh, expounding on He That Believeth on Him. You know, we have to repent and we have to believe. Uh, we have to believe. We have to repent. You know, it's, it's, it's believing and repenting is, is two things that works hand in hand there. And uh, maybe, you know, uh, I don't know if you can really uh, put a order in which it, it happens, but, you know, we have to repent and believe. And, you know, we can't really believe until we repent. I mean, we can believe in a head knowledge, but, you know, when we repent, God puts that belief on in us and we we believe that and you know as we as we uh, uh, go through the process God helps in every every one he gives us the faith to to be able to be saved he gives us that little little bit of faith and then it grows as we as we learn and as we study his word there The uh, memory verse is a very familiar memory verse. It's a memory verse that probably most of us can can, uh, recite. John 3.16. You know, that is a very important verse in the Bible. It is a very, very important verse. This was written by John, one of the disciples... It was written at a time when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. And you know, it all started out, Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. And Jesus uh, uh, told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Wow, Nicodemus was blown away by that, you might say. How can a man be born when he was old, you know? How can he be reborn? Well, Jesus explained to him, and as they went further into uh, the conversation, this is what he told Nicodemus. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And he's talking about himself, his father giving him. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so uh, we're going to, uh, that'll be one of the verses that we're going to study there. So I'm going to, I'm going to leave that with you. I'm going to read a junior emphasis here. Looking, and we're going to be studying about this, looking at the brazen serpent in the wilderness saved people from, from death, from snake bite. Believing on Christ saves people from death in sin. Jesus died to save us from sin. God loves all people. We must believe in Jesus. If we believe and repent, like last lesson was repent, God will save us. If we believe and repent... God will save us. That's, that's, that's a cardinal rule, you know. You have to be serious. And in order to repent, you've got to be serious. Or otherwise, it's just a form of, of habit or, or form of ritual. Or a ritual is all it is. Repenting. Real repentance and really believing in God 
Not just with a head knowledge, but with a heart knowledge of that. Okay, we'll get started in our lesson there, John 3, 14 and 15. And this is also Jesus talking here. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Okay, that's verse 15 sounds a lot like verse 16, which is our memory verse, which we're going to uh, 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 study on. But, you know, Jesus, as we get into verse 16, Jesus was reiterating what he had already said there. And so, uh, so uh, that's, that's, what, uh, that's what he was talking about there. Lifting up, the lifting up of Jesus. Jesus was talking to Nicodemus in Galilee. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent. That's the, what was uh, first, le- uh, first reading there. When was that? Well, in Numbers 21, 9, 8, I mean 4 and 9, uh, we can read the story there. Uh, the Israelites were, were dying from the bite of poisonous serpents or snakes is what it was. Moses, obeying God, made a serpent out of brass and lifted it up on a pole because Moses was told by God to do this. You know, Moses had no idea what to do but to fall down and ask God, God, what am I supposed to do here? You see all these snakes around here? They're biting people. People's dying because of it. What must I do? And God told him, He said, make a serpent out of brass, hang it up on a pole. All who looked at it after they were bitten lived. First, the Israelites faced physical death. We face spiritual death. That's, That's... That's what, this is all symbolizing what took place when Jesus died. Second, sin caused Israel's trouble. Guess what? Sin brought our lost condition also. See, you can see it as a type and an antitype from the Old Testament. The brass image Moses lifted on a pole was of an evil thing, a poisonous serpent. The Son of Man lifted up on the cross was likened unto evil too. Uh, He was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteous of God in Him. Jesus was made a curse for us that he might redeem us from the curse. Um, You know, that's hard to understand, maybe hard for some people to understand. But, you know, that's exactly what happened. Jesus took on all that filthy nastiness of sin because he died. He took that to the cross and died for that. The snake-bitten ones were to look upon the brazen serpent. Moreover, sinners are to look to and believe in Jesus crucified. How many times did, did Paul write in his letter talking about Jesus crucified? Jesus crucified. Well, that's what he is talking about here is through Jesus' crucifixion, we can have a relationship with God. Um, there, number five, their looking involved both belief of and obedience to God's promises. You know, did, did you catch that? We could also put on there, re- repent. We have to repent, which has already been mentioned, but, but don't leave that out. Belief of. And what, it, what else was that word? Obedience. To God's promise. Our turning to Christ involved both belief of and obedience to God's offer. Number six. The Israelites who looked were given physical life. Sinners who believe are given spiritual life. 
You know, we don't only, you know, the Israelites, all they had to do is look at that serpent and they were healed. You know, we as in, in, in today's, we don't just look at Jesus' death, but we have to believe what has happened. That's what we got to do. Back then, like I said, they looked, we look and believe. Number seven, the promise to Israel was conditional. Those who looked received. The promise to us is conditional. Only those who believe receive. You know, Jesus died for all. He didn't leave nobody out. He did not leave not a person out. But it's conditional for that person to accept Christ's death or to reject it. And that's, that's the, that, that is what is so, uh, uh, well, I kind of get up in arms about it. Because it's there. It's for them. It don't cost nothing. The price has already been paid. All you got to do is trade your old tattered garment for a garment that he's going to give give you. And your old sinful heart, give that up, and he puts a new heart within you. Because the brass serpent was similar to Christ, was meant to be a, uh, uh, was meant to be a symbol or picture of Christ who was to come. We call it a type of Christ. Poison represents sin. And that's what the, that's what the, 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 the snakes were doing. It was poisoning the people and they were dying. Just like sin poisoned the mankind in the Garden of Eden. And it carried on. And so there had to be a type, there had to be, it had to be a type then. Poison represents sin. The brass serpent was, was not poisonous, but rather took on the likeness. How can a snake be a type of Christ? Because Christ took our sins on himself. That's what it was. How did he take the sins upon him? That's hard to explain. That's hard to explain. I have to take that by faith and say, you know, he took my sins. He took my sins personally. And we can take it personally that away. Because he took every one of our sins, took them to the, to the cross. Why was Jesus lifted up on the cross? That the ones who believe in him should not perish, not be damned to hell, but have eternal life. We must look to Him. If we refuse to look to Him, we will die in our sins. We will perish. And the, the, the commentator goes on and says, Please look to Christ and live. And that's my plea. Whoever's listening, please, if you haven't turned your heart and life over to Jesus, please look to Him and live. It'll be the greatest day ever for you. You know, you might think back and think that, oh, this was my greatest day, the birth of my child or the marriage of my marriage or whatever it might be. But you know, nothing tops being saved from sin. That is the best, best day of my life. Okay, we'll go on to John 3.16, which is our memory verse. And I've already read it once there, but we're going to read it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Love. For God so loved the world. We can make that personal. For God so loved me. You can, you can read it that way. Because it fits. For God so loved me. He loved everybody. He loved everybody in the world. He, we didn't love him first to get this love. That did not happen because we were enemies with Christ. He loved us, did things for us. We got in the right relationship 
And guess what? That's when we started loving. That's the only time we could love Him is when we got into right relationship with Him. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever... Now, you can change that, that if I... You can make it personal again. Change that. So whosoever, if I believe in Him, shall not perish but have everlasting life. You know, uh, the Bible is very personal. And, you know, this is a blanket statement here for the whole world. But, you know, we can take that and make it very personal to us. And it is very personal. It has to be personal. I can't do it for Ryan. Ryan can't do it for me. You know, our pastor can't do it for us. We have to, we have to be very personal at, at, at that. It's one thing. Our parents can't do it for us. You know, so many times we would like to do things for our, our children. And so many times we can do things for our children. But salvation, we can't do that for our children. They have to do it on their own. Jesus, why did the Father give His only begotten Son, Jesus, to live in the world and die on the cross? You know, it's bad enough that He had to come and live in the world, you know. But what's even worse is He had to die on the cross then. It was to bring us back into the relationship with God. First, look at the why on God's part. For God so loved the world. That's the reason. His great love. He loves all people. Okay, I'm going to do like Brother Bayless says. How many people does that leave out? How many people does that leave out? It doesn't leave out anyone, does it? All people. It says all people. Every person ever born is included in this all. Not, not, not a one is left out. He loves all people. Number one, because He made us all. Number two, because God made us all in His image. And number three, because we will continue to exist eternally, eternally, every one of us, never to end, but, the cho- but there's two places. Either eternal life or eternal death. That's, that's, and, and God wants us to experience the eternal life. Such love and giving is beyond our comprehensions. Nevertheless, we need not understand, just believe. Believe that the Son of God died in our place. He is the atonement of our for I'm sorry he is the atonement for our sins. He is the atonement for our sins. First John 4 and 10 it's not in your uh, cordly there. Herein is love. Not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son to be the prop- propitiation of our sins. Okay, that's a, uh, I think pretty near every time we read that, that's a long word. You know, what does propitiation mean? I looked it up in the, in the dictionary. Propitiate, regain the goodwill of or appease uh, in order to be reconciled back to God is what that word means there. You know, that, yeah, that's a, that's a, a $40 word or whatever you want to call it. But, you know, and we don't use that word a whole lot in normal talking. But that's what that means. Right. To be brought back. To be reconciled back. Okay? First, uh, where am I at here? Okay. Uh, that's the part that God l- took care of. That's the part that, that, that related to God. First we look at God's part. That's, that's, that's what it amounts to there. 
that is what God wanted to do for us. You know, you know, he could have just wiped us all out and forgot about it and said, forget about the whole thing. But no. What was it? There's a four-lettered four word mentioned there. L-O-V-E. That word spells love. And that is, that is uh, 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 what, what he was talking about there. That it was, that was his part. Second, what is, what is the why on man's part? that they should not perish nor die in their sin and go to hell. See, Jesus took care of, 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 of all of that. Jesus took care of that. When God sent His Son to live here on earth and to die, resurrected, went back into heaven, that took care of all of it. Now, that took care of the plan. Let me put it that way. He took care of the plan. Now it's up to us. Are we going to accept that plan or not? You know, people can make plans all the time. You know. You know, they can make plans and, oh, everything, everything looks like it's going to, going to go just perfect. Well, you've got to follow that plan then. Well, that's the same way here. We've got to follow that plan. We know one thing. It's God's plan, and we know God's plan's perfect. You know, sometimes we make plans, and sometimes the plans don't go quite the way they, quite the way we intend for them to go, and we have a little bit of problem. And sometimes we have to oh, go in and redefine, redefine, and recalculate, and redo, and all that kind of stuff. But you know, God's plan is perfect. If we follow God's plan, we won't have any problems whatsoever. I'm gonna, that they should not perish nor die in their sins and go to hell. Instead, he will give us everlasting life. Again, it's conditional. It's up to us. Are we going to accept it? This is his purpose in giving Jesus. Who can have this life? Who can have this life? Didn't it say, whosoever believeth in him? Well, who's the him? In Jesus. That's who he's talking about. You can have it. And I'm not, as I'm speaking out there, who, whoever's receiving this, whoever's hearing this, you can have that. Right. You can have it. Everyone can if we believe. This is important. We must have this eternal life. We must believe in him. We go on into verse 17 there, and it's a continuation of verse 16 there. He goes on and brings out another thought there. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus did not come to condemn us. He came to save. That's exactly what the verse says. It's pretty, pretty simple to to understand that. Nevertheless, nevertheless, some people are condemned. Why? Because they have not believed in Jesus. I was condemned one day. The conscience started working with me. God started talking to me. My conscience started working. Started pricking my heart. You're going the wrong way. Larry, you're on the wrong path. You know, when we're on the wrong well, if we're going to if we're going to go traveling, take a trip, we don't want to get on the wrong road. You know, if we get on the wrong road, we're going to have to get back and get back on the right road so we can get to where we're going. Well, that's the same way with me. I was on the wrong road, headed in the wrong direction, going to the wrong place. But you know, God got a hold of me. God spoke to me and turned me around. Some people are condemned. Why? Because they have not believed in Jesus. Notice they are not going to be condemned sometime. They are condemned already. 
Every person is lost now unless he has believed in Jesus and repented. Remember last week's lesson? And repented. So, you know, unless it sounds to me like the commentator is trying to get over to us. If we haven't repented and believed in Jesus, then we're condemned. We're condemned. That's exactly what it sounds like the commentator is trying to tell us there. And it's true. True. You know, when condemnation comes upon us, and this is through the Holy Spirit, comes, comes upon us, you know, it makes us miserable. We're in a miserable con- condition because our conscience is pricking us, because we're, we know we're doing wrong, we want to do right, we're doing wrong, we can't do right. It seems like we try to do right, we might for a little while, but then things fall apart. That's what, that's what the commentator is talking about. Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. You know, if we believe, if we have repented and believe on him, there's no condemnation in us. You know, we're not condemned. Now, sometimes we may need a little bit of correction. You know, sometimes we might not see the things that that God wants us to see. And he might give us a swat every now and then to get us back where we need to be. But you know, yes, that's that's that pricks us and that 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 gets our attention. But you know, the best thing to do is get right back in the center of God's will, and uh, and and get on about God's business is what it needs to be. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. What is it to believe? What is it to believe? We must believe, one, the fact that the Son of God has come down from heaven and died in our place. That's the first thing we've got to believe there. Two, that he took Our punishment to take away our sin. He took our punishment. The punishment that we were supposed to receive. Jesus took it upon himself then. And says okay. Here it is. Here it is. You can have it now. We must give ourselves over to him to do it. We must give ourselves over to Jesus to be able to do this. We must take Him, Jesus, to be our Savior. We must believe that He does do in us what He has. He will. He will not shirk in His promises. He will not forget any of his promises he will not back up on any of his promises how more can I explain that he is sure in his promises last week we learned we must repent now we must believe if we do these two things believe in Christ with all your heart and repent of sin we will be saved We will be born again as a child. Then we must grow and mature as a Christian without sinning. You know, in our daily readings, I don't know how many of you do do the daily readings that is published in here, but if you did, you learn about the readings and how Abraham believed God and how a woman at the well believed on Jesus. You know, in Abraham's time, you know, Jesus, or God called Abraham out of that country. And, you know, Abraham, uh, you know, you know, when he was called uh, to get out of that country and to go to a place where I will show you is what God told him, where I will show you. 
and not knowing where, where he was going, but just trusting God. And you know, most of the time, that's the way God leads us too. Come and follow me. You know, we don't have to be scared because we're not alone. No, you know, maybe Brother Bayless won't be standing right beside me or the wife will be standing right beside me. But Jesus is always there and he, he will lead us. Same way with the woman at the, at the well there. Uh, uh, how she believed on Jesus. These are examples for us. And then as we read uh, the, uh, Nicodemus one night. Nicodemus believed Jesus, trusted him, and he was saved. You know, Nicodemus came wanting to know answers. You know, a lot of these people that was kind of in the Sanhedrin court and it was uh, the priests and, and, uh, and, and the different ones, you know, they came asking Jesus questions, trying to trip him up. But, you know, Nicodemus was honest. And, of course, he, he was a little bit scared, too, because he came at night, you know. And, and he came to Jesus. And Jesus explained, took time to explain to him because he seen an honest soul right there that was, that was needing salvation. And even the ones that tried to trip, trip Jesus up, they needed salvation too. But Nicodemus was an honest soul there, and, he, and, he, uh, uh, and that's what he did. He believed on Jesus, trusted him, and he was saved. And matter of fact, he was one of them that later helped bury the body of, of Jesus and, uh, and did that. We, as Christians, have a big field out there of people that's, that's needing salvation. You know, we don't have to look very hard here in Lawton. And I, don't, I think it's pretty much all over America. You don't have to look very hard and find lost people. Lost people, they're, they're everywhere. You know, it seems like they're everywhere. And, you know, we have to be in tune with God. We have to believe in God and be in tune with God so that we can bring, like this verse, John three sixteen, to those people, you know, and show them how that, that there's somebody out there that loves you. There's somebody out there that thought enough of you that he gave his life for you. And that's very important to people that are out there lost. You know, some people, you know, they may, may not think that they have a friend in the world. But, you know, we have a friend in Jesus. I think there's a song, What a Friend, What a Friend in Jesus. And, and it's very important that these people realize that i want to read a uh um what it points to consider there is belief enough you see that that's uh, i think it's the second reading there is belief enough see how the difference implicates the implications of faith are intertwined no part can be exercised alone but we quote Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And by grace are you saved through faith. That's uh, Acts 16 and 31 and also Ephesians 2 and 8. And say that if one just believes Jesus died for him, he is saved. In a land of churches, the majority of even non-churchgoers would claim that they believe. And you know, that's, that's true. You know, you ask them, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ. But yet, look how they live. They don't live like they believe in Jesus Christ. Read Jesus' word in last week's memory verse. Can believed without repentance save? True belief will bring repentance. None of the above verses stand alone. The two that I read there. We must take scriptures as a whole, not selecting 
incomplete parts. And you know, that's we can make the Bible say whatever we want to if we take this and that and this and that and put it together. But you know, there's also a scripture that says if you add or subtract or, or fiddle around, might say, with the Bible, that your place is going to be in the lake of fire. You know, I think it says that. I think it's in the Revelation. The New, teach, the t- New Testament teaches both belief and repentance. Is repentance separ- separa- separated from belief, real repentance? My answer is no. Is belief separated from repentance, real belief? My answer to that is no. James writes of Abraham, Seeth thou how faith uh, worth, I can't say that word very good, wroth, which means operate with his works. That's what that word means, isn't it? Isn't that what that word means, to operate? And by works was faith made perfect. That's found in James 2 and 22. You know, we got to work together with God. We've got to work together. Let God lead. You follow. Don't you try and lead and make Jesus follow. That's that's not going to work. But let him lead and he will be a constant companion to us. Uh, forever I am uh, I'm going to read a, a little a little couple of little articles here in this in this book here it's one minute prayers for men I got this a few years ago and I want to I want to read uh, on forgiveness a couple here for forgiveness and it's like a, it's written in like a prayer the scripture that's used, 1 John 2 and 12. I write to you, dear children, because your sins has been forgiven on account of his name. Now listen to this prayer here. Forgiveness of sin is such a great blessing. Don't you agree with that? People, people that's, that have been forgiven of their sins can say amen to this. People that have not been forgiven, they don't understand this. But only, only us as Christians can, receive it, can uh, understand this. Forgiveness of sin is such a great blessing. Lord, he says, Lord, it's hard for me to fathom the depth of your forgiveness towards me. Think about that. The, <laughs> I agree with that. You have forgiven it all. Hasn't left anything. Yes, all of it. Every sin has been laid on Christ, charged to Him. Lord, I have to stop for a moment when I think of it. And then I must praise You for this incredible, undeserved mercy. I must praise you for this incredible, undeserved mercy. We did not deserve anything. We did not deserve anything. All on account of Christ. Praise you, Lord. It still baffles me that you love me so much. I like that. I like that little writing right there. Now I'm going to read you another one. A blessed man. And the verse that they're using here is Psalms 32, 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him and in whose spirit is no deceit. I am a blessed man, Lord. Blessed. And you know, it's written for men. But you ladies can put in there, I'm a blessed woman, you know. Are you blessed? Are you blessed? I know each and every one of you are, and I know you, I know you, 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 you testify of that. But it's written in the man, but, but women can enjoy this just as well, just as much. My past sins are all covered 
gone forever. Don't, don't you remember? He says, put as far as the east is from the west, you know. And you do not count sin against me. Now, we, we have to do our part. We know that. You know, that's, 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 that's all part of it. What a display of love toward me. Make it personal. Father, thank you for this zero balance in my sin account. I know Brother Bethel is liking that because he's he deals with accounts and all, and I know he I know he's enjoying this. <laughs> he understands that. Thank you for this zero balance in my sin account. Not only that, but I have an indefinite positive balance in my grace account. Zero in the sin. Wealthy in the grace account. Your riches of forgiveness and grace toward me make me not only blessed, but incredibly wealthy. Thank you, Father. I'm going to leave that with you there. That, uh, that was two little things that I wanted to, to read to you that went along with the, with the lesson there. Forgiveness is wonderful. And if you haven't experienced forgiveness, you are missing out on the greatest thing. It beats the biggest jackpot ever. And then it's great to be forgiven of your sin and to have that clear conscience and to have that guiltiness taken away and being free. That's, that's what freedom really is. I'll leave it with you on that.